Right. Well, I, I just want to thank you, uh, Vernon, for, for, for joining us uh, and the, taking the time to fill out the questionnaire. Uh, we're going to have uh, a link to your answers uh, on our uh, uh, in uh, in in our, our, our YouTube channel here, uh, so that everyone everyone can see. But I just wanted to spend a little bit of time to ask you to um, expand on on those answers. Uh, but first, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Burhan Azim. I'm a second time candidate for Cambridge City Council. I was the runner up in 2019, so hopefully this time we'll make it on. Um, I did my undergraduate degree when I was at MIT in material science. So really studying on like solar panels and those sorts of things. I volunteered as an EMT in Cambridge for a number of years since then. I, um, you know, you really get to see different side of the city in ambulance. And nowadays I work at a healthcare company that does COVID care, especially for hospitals and, and government systems where, you know, there's too many patients, you can't really get them all into the hospital. And so doing that at home care and triage, as well as I started a nonprofit called Abundant Housing where we do zoning and statewide policy reform. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and I'm sure you'll get to hear all about the good environmental policies in this discussion. Yeah, great, thank you. So one of the one of our first questions that we asked you was about uh, how to create a mitigation resilience path forward uh, in better relations with, with natural systems that we, you know, we live in the very complex, you know, political environment, the existing power structures, um, and sort of the, the trade-offs that we have to do. Um, and one of your answers, you know, really focused down on, on basically getting, getting more people engaged in, in city government uh, and making sure that they're registered uh, uh, and vote in our local elections. How, how would you do a better job of engaging people and, and, and getting a, a broader, diverse audience in, in local elections? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think that, you know, to give you a sense of like the difference we have in how people engage in local governments, 58,000 people out of the 120,000 people in Cambridge will vote in a presidential election, right? Now, not all 120,000 people can vote because some are children, some are not U.S. citizens, but about 58,000 vote in a high turnout election like presidential. You go down to a gubernatorial election, which is typically a low turnout election, and you get about 46,000 people to vote. So, you know, 12,000 people drop off. In a local election, like Cambridge's odd year city council elections, you get about 22,000 to 23,000 people to vote. And so it's less than half. And that's, I think, like a really big stain on our democracy in the sense that like a lot of people in the city, you know, don't really know what's going on in our local politics. They don't really engage. And I think that that means that both like in terms that their views are not represented, but also like part of city council is to have like a platform where you kind of say your piece and try to change people's minds. And if less people are engaged in local politics, you have less of a platform to make a case for, you know, we should be doing these policies and making this change and also asking for that change from your state legislation, state legislators and your governor. Um, the real big focus is on me is really focusing down on some groups where I think we can make pretty big differences. The majority of city of the city residents are renters, for example, 66%. But uh, most renters don't actually partake in local elections. And I think a big part of that is the fact that like um, it can be hard to reach people who live in apartment complexes, as well as um, uh, they tend to be on average newer residents. And it takes you about a decade until after you move to a new place before you start engaging in your first local election. So trying to speed that time up. And so really focusing on the different ways that we can engage with those residents. And I think we've been fairly successful among the young youngest demographic last cycle we, you know, we saw a 10% decrease in uh, voter turnout, but among the youngest population, which is one that we were trying to focus on and is easier to see in the data, we saw a 15% increase in voter turnout. So a 25% delta. And I think that it really does take aim. And I think the biggest thing is just that like, for a lot of people, I know this sounds silly because you know all of us spend so much energy and thought like focusing in on our election, but for a lot of people, they just don't recognize that there is an odd year election or that there are issues that really matter. Um, and so I think like just talking to people and like trying to, you know, very strategically try, uh, bring that up and like raise awareness really does have a big impact because I think once you start getting people to care, they do want to vote and do partake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned that, uh, that the, you know, we have a, a city manager uh, uh, system here, uh, as, as m many people know, uh, very different than a strong mayor system. Mm -hmm. um, so 
you you were saying that that you want to have one that has a uh, that kind of brings in this this engagement in, ter in terms of like their their work. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so I think that the engagement is really important. I think um, a key way to think about it uh, is just like for me at least is like what when you're doing your job like what incentive I, what incentives are you maximizing for? And I think that you know in a low turn on environment where not that many people are engaged, you tend to uh, overfocus a little bit on the numbers around like how much is our bond rating? How much is it like our budget? How much are we saving? Which are of course very important things. We wanna be a fiscally responsible city and you know manage Cambridge well. But I also think that like a lot of residents have other issues on top of their minds around like climate change being a big one. And I think that it can be hard to justify at times in your day-to-day -day work to make bigger term like trade-offs or decisions that really focuses longer term issues. Um, and, you know, where you don't get numbers and metrics you can easily evaluate against um, unless people are engaged in really, really asking for it. And I think that you at Green Cambridge and a lot of other advocates like Mothers Out Front and 350.org and, you know, Sunrise now do a really great job. But I think that bringing more people in, uh, even in that, um, really do it. And like, you know, part of bringing more people in is what you guys are doing. Like, I think Sunrise has done a great job of bringing younger people in um, and all the different advocacy groups are on there as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, you say that you say that we need to make these clear, tangible gains, as you put it, uh, in environmental policy for our low, lowest income residents. Mm -hmm. What 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 kind of gain would you like to see? Do, do you have one that you can offer? Yeah, so I think that this is one that's on the books, but I think is poignant to talk about because it's such a hop on issue at the moment. So we're redesigning Northern Mass Ave right now, and as part of that, we're going to add a bus lane on it. Buses serve uh, our lowest income residents. Uh, people who take public transit in general tend to be lower income than people who drive. Um, it, at peak times, about 56% of people on Mass Ave end up being in one of the buses. And so it transports more people than uh, like you know drivers do. And in Northern Mass Ave, you have two lanes. So you could make one as a bus lane without disrupting you know, people who want to take a car to work. Um, but it's also something that's really difficult in terms of getting it passed at this moment or like not passed in terms of like the pushback we've gotten at this moment. And I think it's really is because like people who tend to take the bus uh, tend to not be the most involved in local politics. And so their voices get proportionally less heard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, going back to our first question, getting more people involved and, you know, gets their, gets their voices heard. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you also say that there's, you know, these, these tensions, you, you know, note the tensions and we all know that, you know, there's tensions like, you know, with housing policy or, or uh, tree canopy cover or uh, bike lanes or travel lanes. It, you know, we have 4,000 acres in the, in the city, uh, which is, you know, uh, uh, not, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a good amount of, of space, uh, but for 112,000 people or, or I forget exactly how many we're at. Uh, in terms of population, it's, it's actually, you know, it's not a lot. And there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of disparities in how, this, in how that, that land is used. You know, uh, West Cambridge, you know, we, we know is, is, is less dense and more, more trees and East Cambridge is super dense and, uh, and less, less trees. Uh, and there's just historical fabric that kind of comes out of that, um, uh, that, you know, that, that there's, there's some reasons behind that, but there's also, ways that we perpetuate it, you know, as well. Um, so, uh, so one of, one of our things right now is, is that because about a third of Cambridge is actually, you know, part of a, some kind of historical wetland. Uh, and those are also places that we um, have some uh, areas that possibly to be develop, developing. How can you say, you say that we need to be more caref careful in developing in, in flood zones? Uh, and uh, how can we how can we do that, but while also trying to hit some of our other 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 goals and needs? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I wanted to pull out two strands of like the uh, context that you set up, and then answer the question directly. So I think there is absolutely a density and tree canopy disparity. Um, you know, and I think that it really depends on which corner of the city. Like I think East Cambridge in particular is very dense. Um, and also doesn't have much tree canopy. I think that Cambridge Fort, where I live, actually is both very dense and has a decent number of tree canopy. So I just wanted to pull out that they're not necessarily uh, 
contradictory. And in some places, you know, like, uh, you know, we can talk about whether we like the structure or not. But my point is just like the Ringe Towers, for example, has a lot of tree canopy in the area, while also being very dense in just three towers. And so I just wanted to point out that, you know, uh, they're, in my mind, they're like related, but they're not exactly the same issue where there's an inverse correlation there. Um, to kind of go directly to your question around, um, you know, development in wetlands, I think it is an area we need to be really careful of, right? Um, so I remember um, uh, in uh, my uh, undergraduate thesis was uh, around, um, or one of my undergraduate theses was around like going to the Hartford Basin in Connecticut. And it's like this beautiful, like, basin area and actually the place you go <laughs> is you go off the side of a highway and highways are great for geological research because they actually just cut through the mountain very cleanly so you can see the difference and you know and there's a giant like hill area and you see about a line that's about like 40 feet higher than I am where it just goes from black dark rock to lighter gray rock and that's because that's where the ocean used to be um, you know about 20,000 years ago um, and so that's all to say that in general, like, you know, we're way below uh, historical highs in terms of ocean levels um, and sea le levels. And that, you know, that is temporary, you know, especially as, you know, climates are rising in the next decade or two, we'll see at least a couple inches of sea level rise, but potentially more if we don't act in terms of mitigating that. And, and you know, you know, the worst case scenarios where you lose co uh, cloud coverage and things like that, you can get much, much higher. Um, so I think the real key is to make sure that we have a plan to account for those. That could be just simply not developing any of those areas if it's too dangerous. It could also be thinking about how we can reroute water or build like barriers or oyster beds or other sorts of things that can kind of soak up water or build resiliency, resiliency in that area. Because you know some of the wetland area we've already built on, um, it's not going anywhere. So part of it is resilience and how do we make sure that those regions will be okay even as sea levels rise. I think the thing that you know we want to avoid is like New Orleans scenario where, you know, they built and developed on wetland areas and the population increased to 800,000 from, you know, 500,000 and then Hurricane Katrina hit and they've had a lot of hurricanes over the last 15 years so the population has gone and decreased to 500,000 just because they weren't able to take care of the rising sea levels. It's a real danger. It's already hit U.S. cities and we have to take very seriously. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's just continue to talk a little bit more about land use um, a bit. Um, so uh, one of our one of our questions was how do, how do we utilize the public way to be more environmentally friendly uh, and really serve the majority of the population? Um, and when I say the public way, I think in, in Cambridge it means most you know we have parks and things like that, but but for the large measure in terms of actual land uh, acreage, you know it's it's uh, it's our streets, um, which are mostly you know asphalt paved you know, uh, almost from right away, right away to right away. Um, so um, you say that we, we just need to fundamentally revisit how much space we give vehicles. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that, you know, um, roads are a very limited resource in Cambridge. We don't have much land as you've talked about before. And roads, you know, we can only fit so many things. We want a lot of things. We want sidewalks, we want tree canopy, tree cover. We want bike lanes, we want bus lanes, we want roads and we, we want public parking. I think that, you know, it's a lot of things to put on our tree, on our roads. And especially, I think this is also a good thing, but it's also a fact is that like, because we're an older city, a lot of our roads are very narrow and we can't fit multiple things on every road. I think one of the places which, are, you know, easiest is really about consolidating parking. I think that like parking is always a touchy issue and we want people to be able to get where they are. And some people are reliant on cars or it's just easier if you have children, if you're older. Uh, but I think that, you know, consolidating some of that green space, uh, uh, some of that space on roads from parking to, you know, may, perhaps moving parking to more centralized location around like parking lots and just having some of that extra road coverage allows us to do a lot more with our streets. And I think uh, would provide a real benefit to a lot of people. Hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the examples you gave was Memorial Drive, and um, uh, Green Cambridge is part of the Memorial Drive Alliance, and really happy to to see a lot of great um, advocacy around that. Uh, but you know, they the state ended up, you know, basically just repaving it the way that the way that it was before, um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But. Um, you know, that Memorial Drive and, and many other parts, you know, all, you know, the Alewife, Alewife Brook and the Alewife Parkway, you know, those are all owned by uh, the state, some state agencies, a lot of them DCR. Um, how do we, 
how do we work better with with state agencies to have you know control over so much of the of some of the most valuable open space and green space or that we have in the city yeah i think it's a real shame that we have this like beautiful like seafront around the city and we have decided to pave a highway over it um you know people do need to get where they need to go especially if they're coming from further you know parts of massachusetts you know uh, like and they need to take, you know, Mem Drive to get what they need to do. That's very important, of course. But like, you know, that area in particular is very precious. And I think that we need to think about how we reuse it. I think that, you know, part of this process is to like understand how state agencies work and be able to get into their development agencies, trying to get buy-in from internal stakeholders and really be able to be part of the conversation. Um, I think it's a difficult conversation to have because we don't have direct power in these agencies. So we can't just say like, oh, we should do this and then, you know, pass a law and get it done. Um, but I also think that it's not that we couldn't have tried harder. Um, I think that, you know, following some of the proceedings and uh, discussions, I think that if we had a city manager and a city council who were more dedicated to revisiting and reusing Memorial Drive, I'm not convinced that we could have pushed DCR to have a different solution. I mm -hmm. think it was something that we you know, at a high level, perhaps had a different version, but it wasn't the concrete and continuous advocacy we needed to be able to make such a big change to such an important road. I think that if we did go through the process, uh, I think that there's potential for some change. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just having that sort of um, uh, leadership within the city, you know, to, to advocate better for the state at the state level. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, one of the questions you always get from people is like, what are the difference between the candidates? Because I think a lot of our values are the same. Um, and I think it is really, you know, you only get a few things to prioritize. And you only get a few places where you're really willing to go every day or, you know, very frequently every week, and like, just like kind of hammer it home until someone makes progress on it. And I think that, you know, that's the real difference uh, in a lot of places. And so having that space for advocacy really makes a pretty big difference. Mm. Um, so our, our last question was about uh, just renewable energy, energy use, you know, all just in general. We asked you a bunch of questions about some of the programs we have available to us, like right now with um, our community electricity aggregation purchasing program, which um, I know a lot of people, um, some people know about and some people don't know about because it's just, a, you know, it's, you know, you want to make sure the light switch turns on, right? Um, and you know, right now it's not a default that we go. So that, that program has this, you know, option where we can go a hundred percent, a hundred percent green, so to speak. Um, and, and, but right now that's not the, that's not the default. And, um, so, um, what do you think about that program and, 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 and other, you know, that's just one program, but there's, a, there's other pieces on that. So if you could talk about, talk about that just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's a program that like uh, my household opts into and I'm very proud of. Um, and I think that in general for these sorts of programs, I think having a clear decision is very helpful. Um, so this is just about this specific program, but then we can sc scope uh, zoom out. I think that um, if you make it opt in, even if someone wants, um, there's actually a great, uh, um, my partner is a, a behavioral economist. So this is something we talk about. It's like, there's actually a great uh, study around like, when you want to donate organs, you know, like at, at your time of death, you want to be an organ donor. And if you make it opt in, 20% of people will say they want to. If you make it opt out, 90% of people won't opt out. And so 90% of people will be organ donors. And I think they both have their difficulties in that you want more people to opt in. People do say if you force them to ask that they do want to opt in, but they just don't think about changing the option. And if you make them opt out, maybe they made that decision without reading it clearly and they do regret that decision. But if you make them make the decision where they have to check yes or no, uh, then uh, more often than that, you get about 75, 80% of people who do opt in to become organ donors. And I think that's kind of the same situation here where I think that a lot of people would be willing to pay slightly higher to have like totally renewable energy and clean energy sources. But I think really going to a point where you're, you know, really pushing people to make a decision, yes or no. So it is conscious. They realize that they will be paying slightly more, at least in the short run. Um, but you know they want to make a decision. I think will really increase the rates around general adoption of these policies and things like that. Um, 
and now I forgot the second part of your question. So. Uh, the second part was just more about the, you know, the, the other, uh, I mean, go, checking a box to be hundred percent green is, 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 is wonderful. And, you know, everyone should, everyone should do it. Uh, but we know that, you know, our power grid and um, our sources of, of where our energy comes from um, is more of a regional, regional thing. Uh, and there's lots of organizations that, you know, that work on that. Um, and you had said that we should advocate for more wind and solar. Um, so if you just want to talk more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the biggest sources of our energy right now are like natural gas, um, hydro from Canada, as well as um, a few smaller sources. I'm forgetting. I think that solar is a really great source. Um, obviously, something that people can do by themselves and the city can help incentivize. Um, I think solar, uh, at least at the time uh, that I was doing research on it, was is has gotten to a price point where it's like, after installation is about the same price or cheaper than traditional electricity. And so it's a great option, especially at the point we're at now. Um, and I think so like investing in that is wonderful. I think we're also in, you know, Massachusetts, we're not the sunniest state, although I think we have a, you know, a lot of sun for solar, um, but like wind is, I think a real advantage, especially around, um, you know, the Cape area. And so I think advocating at the state level for a lot of wind installation uh, would make a really big difference and it would be a wonderful energy source for the state. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned natural, natural gas and, you know, there's this, there's a movement uh, that's happening with, uh, with, you know, various groups around the, around the country and, and advocates uh, to kind of, so that we can move away from natural gas. Um, you know, and we, you know, we moved to natural gas because, you know, coal was, coal was too dirty uh, and oil was too dirty. And then it's like, you know, the whole thing was like, well, you know, move to natural gas, it's clean. But now we're finding that, oh, natural gas is actually, you know, it's, it's pretty dirty as well. Um, and so, um, but that's, but that's kind of the, one of, one of the big choices available to us. And, you know, all these new buildings and things that have gone up, every single one of them, as far as I know, has some sort of natural gas uh, connection, uh, sometimes a very large natural gas connection. Um, but we, you know, we've seen uh, policy efforts in Brookline and, and here as well to, you know, to, to move away from that. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, how, 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 you, how we could, you know, potentially move away from, from natural gas when it's such like a big part of like how we heat our homes and, and, and clean our water? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that's holding back change on natural gas is that misconception of what you're saying around natural gas being clean. Um, and I think it's because of a fundamental error in our math and our analysis that happened at the time where we were trying to divert more to natural gas um, that I don't think we fully understood. So like, if you have an ice cap, right? 90% uh, of the sun's energy will be reflected back into the atmosphere, 10% is absorbed. If it's water, 90% is absorbed, 10% is reflected back. Uh, that's a very important concept to hold because when we were switching to natural gas, we were thinking like, oh, like carbon dioxide, you know, coal emits a lot more of it is really bad. It stays in our atmosphere for a hundred years. Methane, which is, you know, the byproduct of natural gas is only in our atmosphere for eight years. It decomposes after that, it's not a big problem. Um, and even though, you know, natural gas is a little, uh, methane is a little bit more important than CO2 in terms of like, you know, uh, the bad things it does in our atmosphere, you know, it's only eight years, it's not that bad in net. The problem is in that eight, during that eight years, a lot of the ice will melt and turn into water. And so even though the methane is only in the atmosphere for eight years, you know, once you have that ice melt into water, a lot more of the sun's energy is absorbed so that it completely, you know, wipes out any gains you get from methane. And that's a really like strong misconception that I think that still carries on around like methane actually in net total um, from all the research I've read and done is actually worse than a lot of uh, cleaner forms of like cleaner form, uh, but in general, like of coal and other sorts of things. So it's really not great for the environment. And I think it is quite urgent for us to like move off from it. I think that, um, you know, it's really about making investments at this point. I think that we're getting a lot of money from the national government, uh, at this point with like the various like stimulus bills that are being passed. And I would really love for us to invest more in like wind and solar and, you know, purchasing more hydro as a short-term solution as well. Mm -hmm. well that's great. Well, um, that's, that's all the time we have uh, for, for today. And um, I just want to, you know, thank you again for, for the, the time you've given and, and your, your answers and things and, and um, 
you know, wish, wish you luck uh, in, the, uh, in the election. All right, thank you so much, David. All right, thank you.